We have with us today Darshan Narvais, who has beautifully graced us with her presence. She has been a wonderful speaker at our conferences and in our Monday Live series, and we're just thrilled to have her here with us today to speak with us about baby ethics. She is a professor of psychology at the University of Notre Dame and who focuses on moral development and flourishing from an interdisciplinary perspective, integrating anthropology, neuroscience, clinical, developmental, and educational sciences. Dr. Narvaez's current research explores how early life experience influences moral character in children and adults. She is a fellow of the American Psychological Association and the American Educational Research Association and is former editor of the Journal of Moral Education. She has published more than 20 books, including Indigenous Sustainable Wisdom, First Nation Know-How for Global Flourishing, Basic Needs, Well-Being and Morality, Fulfilling Human Potential and Embodied Morality, Perfectionism, I'm sorry, Protectionism, Engagement and Imagination. Her recent book, Neurobiology and the Development of Human Morality, Evolution, Culture and Wisdom, won the 2015 William James Book Award from the American Psychological Association and the two, 2017 Expanded Reason Award. She writes a blog for Psychology Today, Moral Landscapes, and hosts the webpage EvolveNest.org. Today, Darsha will be speaking with us again about baby ethics, looking at APA's guiding principles described in Nurturing Human Potential and Optimizing Relationships from the Beginning of Life by McCarty and Glenn, 2017, provides a general orientation to honoring children and mothers. But how do these principles fit with ethical principles in medicine, which often influences how babies begin their lives? We discuss today the evolved basic needs of babies and how they are met through a unique application of ethics within a responsive environment. Thank you so much for joining us today, Darsha, and students and participants, we will be saving our questions until the end of Darsha's presentation, but please feel free to write your questions along the way or comment in our interactive chat area. And we will be sure to come back to your questions at the end of the presentation. So welcome Darsha, thank you so much for joining us today. It's an honor to be with you. I feel the love of this community. It's just marvelous. I uh, wish I could hang out with you guys all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm here to, uh, well, I'm rather known as a fierce advocate for babies. And so uh, that's what I'll be kind of presenting is that perspective, really. Um, we, we harm babies a lot, I think, in the practices that we've, our culture has pressured us into. So uh, so we'll see what you think, and I'll be very happy to hear your comments and questions later on. So I'm going to share my PowerPoint now. All right, can you see? Yes, it's all, all good? All right, so. Uh, I'm uh, defining here babies uh, as children who are less than about two and a half years old. I mean, every baby is a little different in terms of the development. So let's get started. Uh, disclosures, I receive miniature royalties from my books <laughs> and from the blog at Psychology Today. Not very much stuff there, but uh, that's needed to tell you. So. APA's 12 Guiding Principles, I think, are just remarkable, insightful uh, guides for our treatment of young children and mothers as well, uh, family life. And these are so um, uh, thorough, I think, uh, that uh, you really almost don't need to expand on them. But I will. <laughs> I'm going to talk about the work that we do in my lab and how um, 
we focus in on the evolved nest for babies. And we'll come back to these principles and see um, how they fit, I guess. So in medical ethics, there are four basic principles that uh, people uh, adopt uh, and promote in medical ethics education. And these are things that nurses and doctors are supposed to be following. And so I want to uh, look at how these apply to infant care because I think they're not always applied in a way that is um, best for babies. So the first one uh, is respect a patient's autonomy. And this is defined as knowing a person's right to hold views, make choices, engage in actions that are congruent with their beliefs. And for helping professionals, this means to refrain from actions that are disagreeable to the other. Uh, and have positive uh, obligations to provide the right information that help that person's um, choice making. Now, of course, babies don't have much autonomy, right? They have little capacity for autonomy, but their autonomy as adults can be undermined if their early needs are not cared for or if they're responding to appropriately. So with undercare, which I'll discuss later, they're less likely to actually develop uh, their secure attachment, for example, we've studied that quite a bit, and all sorts of neurobiological functions like stress response, vagus nerve function, which is a 10th cranial nerve that relates to all major systems of the body. And these things, uh, stress response as well, if they're not set properly and they're set to be, they're scheduled to be set properly in those first couple years. And if they're not set properly because of distressful experience, the child is less likely to be self-controlled in various ways uh, and less intelligent, socio-emotionally intelligent, able to get along with others in a flexible, attuned way. And uh, their stress response will kick in easily and then they will the blood flow shifts away from higher order thinking and feeling open, and they will then get very, very self-protective. So this early life is really important for establishing the, um, the unfolding of that unique person who is that baby. The second principle is beneficence, to act in the best interest of the patient or the client. So this means doing or promoting good, preventing harm, and um, removing conditions that are harmful. And this is a positive, uh, providing benefits to others, reducing costs and risks uh, to achieve the best possible results. Now for babies then, I think my per perception from what I read about medical kind of whistleblowers <laughs> and um, other people who examined the early, especially early life experience in hospitals of babies is that there's a conflict that medical personnel often have. Actually, maybe they don't even have a conflict because they orient themselves to the mother or to the doctor's needs, right, instead of the baby's needs. And so they uh, will separate the baby from the mother without really thinking too much about the harm of that. Uh, and we know now quite a bit of, about that and how it undermines um, just separating uh, mom and baby, which I'll mention again later, I think, uh, is uh, undermines that bonding, that magical magnetic bonding that's hormonally ready to happen after birth under natural conditions anyway. And um, having letting babies cry, I see uh, some of my uh, nurse friends who seem to not be aware that letting a baby cry when they're, you know, trying to do something good for the baby, like weigh them at, you know, uh, a well baby um, meetings, they don't realize that they need to be careful about that. So I think there's a lot of just assumptions that babies don't feel much pain. They don't, you know, uh, uh, they're just, you know, growing quickly. Just give them uh, uh, minimal, I think, in my view, minimal care to keep them going. And then, you know, they get through this period of uh, extreme helplessness. So I think what we do then is we minimize baby needs and then we actually cause harm without knowing it. And so our, our research is now pulling together all the neuroscience and all the clinical science showing that actually all these little things do matter. If you do them re uh, repeatedly, uh, extremely stress that baby, 
um, more than um, than uh, momentarily, I suppose. So then the third one is uh, promote justice or fairness. So this is a fair, equitable, appropriate treatment for in light of what's owed to that person or persons generally. And this one, I think, again, is uh, justice and fairness for whom? Again, I think adults tend to think about other adults. Adults don't think about baby needs. They kind of, a lot of adults don't remember being a baby <laughs> uh, for various reasons, probably because of the stress and trauma they probably experienced themselves. I uh, don't remember those early years. And um, doctors have uh, developed practices when, uh, that are still in place that were developed when doctors thought babies didn't feel any pain. Right, uh, and so they still have those practices in place, and bright lights and smells and uh, harsh uh, cloth and all sorts of things that actually then are traumatizing that baby uh, in miniature ways, I suppose people would say, but still have an effect on how the neurobiology is developing in that child. You you, you traumatize them, and the the trajectory for development goes in a different direction. It, the biochemistry of being of being shifts. If you're stressing that baby, the biochemistry, you know, more cortisol flowing in the brain melts synapses, prevents synapses from growing, uh, and shifts the trajectory. So every little kind of situation that uh, we put babies into should be considered. Non-maleficence is the fourth one, to do no harm. And this means avoiding doing harm or evil to others, refrain from causing pain, suffering, offense, depriving um, others of necess necessities. And so persons in helping professions have an obligation to avoid imposing the harm of, uh, the risk of harm through any kind of neglectful um, professional behavior. Well, how do we know what's harmful? I mean, it, as I've said, the professionals often don't realize they've set up practices and procedures that are harmful to babies. Now we know. Uh, and they didn't know then when they set those up. So how is it we understand what's normal or optimal for a child, for a baby in their early, especially in the early life? Uh, unfortunately, I think a lot of scientific publications, even in my field of psychology, act as if or there's no baseline. They don't know what's best for baby. Let's test. Is it formula or breast milk? I don't know. Gee, <laughs> you know, as if we have no millions of years of experience to let us know what is proper and uh, optimal. So what happens then is studies get published, you know, oh, well, breast milk didn't matter that much. And they only test three months worth of it versus formula. And they look at one variable. And so there's a lot of misleading research out there. A lot of harm being done because of a lack of baselines. Uh, for example, uh, there's an article a few years ago that many of us wrote in and said, you need to take out, take down this article, remove it because it's unethical. <clears throat> and this was um, Price et al. One of uh, the authors was a sleep training clinic uh, uh, owner. Um, and so they they argued there was no harm done for sleep training, but they used a, a poorly wrought intent to treat uh, approach where they told the experimental group something to do. They didn't tell the control group anything. And then five years later, they looked at one variable and found no difference, but they didn't know what the groups did. They didn't measure that. And so then they conclude in the abstract, which is what most doctors read, that sleep training's good, best, not harmful. It's actually beneficial for children of all ages. <laughs> it's like, what? <laughs> really crazy stuff. And I think, fortunately, and I find we find this with our work that when I make presentations, parents who have not responded to their baby in the way that I'm going to tell you about, the, what we call the evolved nest, often protest and say, oh, breast milk doesn't matter, right? And the philosopher yelled at me once at a conference about that. Or a, a German philosopher at another conference said, I don't want to have to touch my children. You know, as if, you know, and then they, they argue, as some of the books like Crib Sheet, they 
justify their lack of providing whatever it is that baby needs. So we have to get away from that slippage in what, what we think is normal for baby care, what we think is normal for, you know, how personalities development develop, what we think is normal for adults. We kind of think now that adults are naturally selfish. And that's just not true. It's not our species history, but people have forgotten and the baselines have slipped, slipped so much, and I'll show you that later, that we don't realize um, where we are. We're the frogs in the pot that's starting to boil. So again, we're misled because researchers often have no baseline for what is normal good for babies. So in effect, these medical principles, medical ethics principles are good, but they're not enough because you have to know something. You have to know what the appropriate baselines are. You have to have some knowledge and skills uh, to go with that. So where do we find a baseline? Well, we have, <clears throat> excuse me, we have multiple heritages. We are mammals and we have tons of animal studies showing how emotion systems develop in early life. They're shaped by experience and especially for humans because we're born so immature compared to other hominids, other apes, that we need much more external womb experience than other animals. <clears throat> and um, these animal studies show us because they can um, treat um, one set of animals differently than another and then they can actually look at their brains. We can't do these kinds of experiments with people, so we have to look at those animal studies. And we also are social mammals. We actually have a whole bunch of basic needs um, that have to be provided for, which I'll mention in a moment, I think. And uh, we also have a lot of inheritances that we forget we have because the emphasis is so much on genes. Uh, genes is just one of many things. Uh, we have cells that uh, we inherit, body plans that are not genetically transmitted. We have epigenetic programming. That means our genes are turned on or off by experience, especially in sensitive periods in early life, but throughout life, we're always turning our genes on and off. When you get out of bed, that's a different set of genes that are being turned on, or when you go to bed, uh, when you learn some new uh, skill, you're, you're developing and turning on new genes, uh, newly. <clears throat> we're also developmentally plastic, meaning we, we are shaped by our uh, social experience and our biology is shaped, we're biosocial creatures. So our biology is shaped by how we are treated, our caregiving system that we have in early life especially, but throughout childhood and even ongoing, we, need, we all need a support system. And then that kind of biology that's been shaped is uh, related to how well we get along with others. As I mentioned earlier, if the stress response has been mis- uh, or over enhanced, then that's going to make it hard to get along with others. Example. So we have uh, what we call then the developmental niche. That's what I'm going to talk about, the evolved nest. And we self-organize around all our experiences. I was just mentioning the microbiome is part of our inheritance, maternal ecology, what our mother's body is like, how healthy it is, our local ecology outside of uh, mother's body and the culture that we are immersed in. All those things are inheritances and they all interact to shape the personality of the, the individual. And to find baseline then, uh, what I do is I look at the small band hunter-gatherer societies. They are the kind of societies in which humanity spent 99% of its history. Uh, these are uh, all over the world still, although they're under quite duress with the globalization of capitalism everywhere. Um, but uh, these societies are nomadic, they're foragers, they don't have possessions, they are fiercely egalitarian, and they show uh, very cooperative personalities and um, very good health. Um, we can say more about that later, but Anyway, so what I do is I, I look at their culture and child raising practices. So what kind of um, supports do they give to children? That's our evolved nest. So if we think again about who we are, we're animals, we know that. Uh, we need nourishment and warmth. Unfortunately, it seems to me in the United States, a lot of parents and a lot of adults think that's enough for babies. They forget that we're um, mammals, that we need responsive care, and that means ongoing moment by moment for a baby. We need lots of affection and play. These are things that build the brain. 
in a good way. And we're social mammals, so we need extensive bonding and we need community support beyond just our mom or our mom and dad. And then throughout life, we need, uh, we are intersubjective. Uh, we need that <clears throat> mind melding, that uh, communication back and forth of signaling what we're thinking and feeling with someone else and, and really uh, connecting. We need that with multiple adults. We need commu uh, communal rituals as well to keep us feeling safe. And we need, as time goes on, apprenticeship and adult activities and then the stories that guide us, uh, our understanding of who we are. And so all these things are interacting in the, in the life of that child. And I think what we've done is we've undermined a lot of these other pieces. We get adolescents, for example, with no narrative. They haven't been going to church or temple or some, some place to get a narrative about who they are in life. And so they latch on to a hate group because they find it online. It gives them a sense of purpose. So it's really important to be very intentional about all these pieces to develop a well-functioning, ethical human being. So what I'm going to argue here then is that uh, ethical treatment of babies is to provide <coughs> provide what they need to grow well, and unethical treatment is to deny or undermine or degrade what babies need to grow well. So here's the early nest, the evolved nest we call it, the evolved developmental niche in our academic publications because that's what people told us we should call it. Uh, but it's the nest, our, our human nest. It's been, a, most of these practices have been around 30 to 40 million years. They're part of our social mammal heritage. What's distinctive for humans is to have multiple parents, alloparents, multiple adult caregivers, <coughs> and to have a little more of a range on breastfeeding length. So you can see here, touch, uh, we need that to feel, uh, well, to actually, it's got all sorts of effects. Uh, shapes the vagus nerve to function well. Polyvagal theory, uh, that Stephen Porges' work, uh, tells us all about that. Uh, Michael Meany's work, turning on genes that control anxiety, is very important for uh, early touch, especially for six months of life for human beings. Ten days for a rat. <laughs> That's what they study. And then responsiveness, prompt response to, to needs. And this means keeping babies in optimal arousal uh, so that the biochemistry is promoting growth rather than undermining it or stopping it, which happens when you separate uh, baby from mother. Um, I sh I'm sorry, this is an old uh, wording here. It should say breastfed frequently, not nursed, uh, and uh, two or three times initially because the baby's stomach is so tiny and our milk is a thin variety, not a thick variety. Predators have thick milk. We have thin milk, which means it has to be ingested frequently because it's a bath for the biology of the child, uh, biochemistry. Alloparents, multiple adult caregivers, so it's not just mom or mom and dad, but a lot of others uh, around um, half the time in these small band hunter gatherers, it's someone other than mother who's holding that child or carrying it. Uh, and then positive social support, high social embeddedness, feeling like you belong, like you're wanted, play, uh, self-directed play in the natural world of multiple age playmates. This is also builds the brain and body well. And then the soothing perinatal experiences, which are kind of the focus of, of um, many of the app principles is that primary period before birth, uh, gestation, birth, postnatally, all those things need to be soothing and supportive. And what I argue in all my publications now is that the lack of these experiences, the degradation of these experiences actually re represent undercare. And we have a whole society of undercared for people. As a result, as you can see, we don't do these things, right? Although when I talk to international groups, the South Asians uh, nod their head and say, oh yeah, 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 we know that. It's not a big deal to them. And the Western Europeans go, what? what? <laughs> so uh, yeah, it depends on the culture. So undercare then, so to say it more explicitly, that when children don't receive what they evolved to expect, the early nest, they're more likely to develop increased stress reactivity, for, for example, from 
uh, poorly developed vagal tone, the HPA axis, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal gland axis related to the major stress response, and to have misdeveloped gene expression of all kinds. But this one, Mini Studies, is the one that controls anxiety. So for the rest of your life, when something new happens, you get all anxious, the rest response kicks in. You can't think very well because the blood flow shifts. You're not going to be open-minded or open-hearted. And I think we have a, a lot of people in our country that are in that, um, have that issue. And it kind of doesn't bode well for democracy. All right, so what's gone wrong for babies in medical treatment? I think here we can agree that medical practices are really toxically stressing babies. Birth, for example, separation from mom and baby causes multiple systems to become dysregulated. This is what the animal studies show us. Babies can't self-calm, they don't self-soothe, that's a, a myth. And so distress wreaks havoc on the developing systems. They might get quiet after a while just to stay alive if you leave them to cry um, or leave them alone, uh, but that doesn't mean they're growing well, optimally or normally optimally. So there's lots of animal studies uh, showing that even short-term separations from the mother can have long-term detrimental effects. I think it was, uh, I can't remember if it's goats, sheep, or horses. But one or more of those kinds of studies where they separated just for an hour a day at birth from the uh, mother at, in adolescence, those offspring had trouble getting along with others. So these are long-term kinds of things that can happen that you don't see right away. So the adults think, oh, it's okay. Second one is ignoring babies' discomfort and cries. And this to me is mistreatment. It encourages, and when professionals do this in the hospital, for example, it encourages parents to treat the baby the same way. They think, oh, it doesn't matter if the baby's crying because look, well, you know, what they're doing to the baby and the baby's crying and they don't seem to care. I guess it doesn't matter. So it's really modeling parental insensitivity, whereas all the research in psychology, developmental psychology, is that looks at responsiveness and parental sensitivity to the signals of the, the child is one of the key variables for optimal development in everything you look at. So then we have the third example is the inattentive, uh, inattentiveness to traumatic experiences, painful procedures. You et al. pointed out that in um, neonatal care units, there are a lot of painful procedures, bright lights, small, strong smells, harsh, you know, cloth and all sorts of things that actually undermine the optimal development of the child. And what does it do? High levels of cortisol in the brain melt synapses. So that's what's supposed to be growing a million a second. Synapses are supposed to be growing. And if you distress the baby, that ain't gonna happen, right? Uh, and so various brain systems are misdeveloped. Now the brain is pretty um, resilient and tries to then take care of uh, meeting whatever was missed. But after a while, it, it becomes apparent later uh, that there's a gap in the foundations of the brain. There's so many levels and layers. And if this one is missing, the brain kind of compensates for a while. But then maybe in adolescence or early adulthood, they, that the systems just can't stand on that gappiness. And then you have some mental health issues or um, other um, health issues. So we have lots of um, studies on mammals showing the long-term harm that distressing young offspring can have on mammalian brains, starting with Harry Harlow and his monkeys. All right, so we, though, are the most complex organism with the most extensive maturational schedule. It hap we take three decades to become adults. We're not really adults, the, and the neuroscientists tell us, till age 30. And our other, our cousins, our ape cousins, hominids, they're adults by age eight. <laughs> it takes us three times as long to become an adult. And so we have a lot that's still being shaped after birth that uh, we have to pay attention to and it, because it lasts a lifetime. So we know from uh, various studies that are kind of retrospective that trauma, abuse, or neglect in early life, um, which is called developmental traumatology, leads to these problems in these areas. These are all malformed stress response, immune system, endocrine system, the number of neurotransmitters you have. So you want more, you want them to function well, to be intelligent um, emotions and 
so on, corpus callosum. All these things for boys are a more, uh, the, the, the lack of support in early life for boys is much more impactful because they're born with less built-in resilience. Girls have kind of a lot of systems that are duplicated or um, they're able, they have more, they're more, they develop more rapidly and so the, the uh, undercare doesn't have as big an effect on them as boys, of course it does. Uh, but boys really need more of the nest than girls do and for longer because they develop more slowly. What we do in our culture is we give them less support, right? And then we blame them and then we expect boys are, you know, normal to be aggressive. It's not normal. <laughs> They haven't gotten enough play. They haven't gotten enough affection. They've been stressed out too much. Uh, infant circumcision is one of those big stressors too. That kind of undermines uh, all sorts of um, life uh, long um, psychosocial, biological, physical things. All right, so probably have to keep going. So how can healthcare professionals then treat babies ethically? Well, there are three general approaches um, to making decisions, moral or ethical decisions. These are the most common ones. One is to focus on universal duties or human rights. And this is usually boiled down to the minimal. What's do, the, do no harm, uh, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Uh, but often this is uh, minimized to just don't hurt anybody. <laughs> Uh, and then another one is uh, maximize welfare, so maximize outcomes for all at, on average. So there might be someone who suffers, but if the, most of the group is benefited, then that's a good thing. And then the last is virtuous action. This is Aristotelian. So the first one is Kant, Immanuel Kant. The second one is more um, Smith, Adam Smith. And then uh, the third one is more um, Aristotle take virtuous action, act in the right way for the situation, taking everything into account. Um, so this is being a virtuous agent. And this fits actually with um, philosophies around the world. Uh, a lot of Chinese philosophies is oriented that way, the third way. Okay, so let's look at the first one. Uh, duty and rights do no harm. Now, if we take the baby's perspective, I think we can agree that babies or adults should not try to harm children, but they need uh, good information again what babies about what babies need. <clears throat> and so, practitioners, uh, healthcare providers, need to know what babies' baseline uh, care should look like, and then provide parents with alternatives to the cultural practices that are harmful, like sleep training. Uh, instead, uh, um, for example, of separating babies too, or especially from touch at night, uh, that's another thing that's harmful. Uh, and so that, I mean, there's a lot we could talk about here. You probably have questions about it. I'll just keep going though, because of, for the sake of time, we need to honor baby, baby rights then as part of this first one. The baby, I think we can argue that babies have the right to be given what they need. We need a baby bill of rights here. They need compassionate care from a welcoming community. So they shouldn't be isolated or untouched or separated. Um, there's a um, recent uh, essay or blog about how children and carriers are becoming developmentally delayed because they spend so much time in a car seat or a carrier or a crib or alone, untouched or uncarried. Uh, those, um, and there's other studies showing that, that uh, even in adolescence, they look developmentally delayed because they haven't been touched enough. And babies should not be subjected to painful experiences uh, like circumcision, I would say. And there are other ways to welcome baby in the Jewish community, for example. But our, our uh, county uh, hardly has any Jews living here, but 97% of babies are circumcised, of boy babies are circumcised. And this is because it's a profit-making um, piece of the medical uh, institutions. So, and of course, babies should have breast milk, the optimal elixir. So many things about breast milk are marvelous. Um, so I'm gonna keep going though. The second approach is to choose actions that result in the best outcomes. So the first one was about baby rights and human rights. Now this one is best outcomes focused. So, you know, when people make decisions, they kind of use all three of these things. 
in some combination, but each one emphasizes one piece or another. So the first one emphasizes rights. Uh, this one emphasizes outcomes. So what can we, um, so when we think about outcomes for families, uh, I think um, we do need to take the needs of parents into account, but our heritage is not parents alone with the baby in the house. It's extended family, it's other community members that are helping. And so we uh, now have shifted baselines on what we think is normal for how we live. And so it forced exhausted parents into being alone with a child and that just leads to all sorts of problems. So there's a way that we have to move in here and reestablish a new baseline for what the baby needs. The baby needs presence of adults all the time, 24 seven. And that means we need to have help parents find ways to coordinate uh, sharing care with others, like uh, moms going to each other's houses and doing laundry for a day there and cooking meals for the week there and then going to someone else's house the next time. And so the kids are together, the moms are together, we can support that kind of thing we have to do now in this era where extended families are separated and extended families some of them don't even know how to care for a baby anymore and give the wrong advice. <clears throat> so let's go on. And then the third approach is to take virtuous action. What would a good person do? What's the right way to behave in this situation? And what are the right reasons for that? And this is a character oriented approach to making decisions to um, If you see yourself as a compassionate caregiver, then you're going to want to promote compassion towards everyone in the situation. And it means taking into account the whole context and one's, you know, your own impact um, in light of who you want to be. So it's very focused on relational uh, responsibility here in the moment. And virtue is about attending to the uniqueness of each situation and every situation is unique and um, trying to enhance the flourishing of all in that moment. So here, this means promoting I, thou relationships, treating with reverence the other, with reverence, especially for babies, I would say here, because I'm advocating for babies here. Uh, and we all have an ethical responsibility then in this view to treat babies like persons, not objects, giving them equal respect, responding kindly to the needs of the baby, and um, as I've mentioned, the medical professionals may be the first role models for doing this for a mother uh, and father and family member. <clears throat> and they can be the ones then that lead us into understanding how to put babies' needs first and respect them as persons. So uh, there's some bad things. <laughs> Just go through a few cultural misdirections. <coughs> <coughs> So forcing babies into independent sleeping is good for them, is a misbelief. Uh, and putting babies on a, a road to independence early is actually through um, trying to get them to sleep. I mean, it's good to, for babies to sleep, but it's not normal for them to sleep alone. And it's not normal for our species for them to be forced into sleeping alone. And this belief then is accompanied by <clears throat> uh, belief that babies need to learn, you have to force them to learn to settle themselves. And it helps them establish self-regulation, emotional well-being, and <clears throat> establishing self-reliance. All these things are not right, are incorrect from our studies of animals, especially, but also <clears throat> the few studies that have been done with babies. So, sorry. <clears throat> So let's go to another one. Um, <clears throat> the, well, baby independence generally, I think really means detached adults. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm from a baby's perspective. Uh, it seems like the adults just won't, don't wanna be attached to that baby. And we have increasing amounts of insecure attachment in our society, more and more avoidant attachment people. That means they wanna keep you at arm's length. That's what avoidant attachment means. I want you in the house, but I, I don't want you in my room, right? And it seems like that's probably playing a role here in the rationalization that adults then take up um, to say, oh, maybe you should be independent anyway, because maybe they were forced into it themselves, right? And that's how you got it. 
avoid attachment. You got enough attention, so you didn't get completely disorganized, or but you were not encouraged to be emotionally connected. There's also then the cultural promotion um, uh, of this in various ways from sleep experts, you know, and I here I write a blog for psychology today and parents will write, uh, write or and tell me that they were urged, you know, to be in charge of the baby and that they were so uh, they were so kind to the baby and giving them the baby everything they needed in the first few months. And then people were starting to tell them, oh, you got to get your life back or, you know, wow, what's wrong with you? You're spoiling the baby. Uh, and so then they tried sleep training and <laughs> regretted it immensely and write me, you know, this one guy wrote me, he said he was in the laundry room with his baby. They told him to put the dryer on so he wouldn't hear the crying and he, he just couldn't take it. So he's trying to comfort his baby now. <sighs> so... We have, uh, I would say, in the last 50 years, degraded our nest. It's been happening for a few hundred years, so uh, I guess I don't have time to go through other examples. But uh, so we were really one of the worst places to raise a baby because we have no parental leave and we have all sorts of undermining, uh, ways to undermine uh, beliefs about babies. And we have our health disadvantage compared to other nations for every, compared to all the other developed nations. We are at the worst in various ways and our child well-being is really undermined as well and epidemics of mental health problems this is just like things are getting worse instead of better cried out sleep training yes it's bad so i'm going to go on here <clears throat> and we, uh, uh ian sati back in the 1930s argued that at least since the 19th century mothers have been advised not to spoil their children so we really have a a um, taboo on tenderness is what he called it and that they argue that coddling children is harmful to them. Of course, that's, I mean, they have it all misunderstood of how that happens. How do you make a weak and whiny child is you don't give them what they need or you make them scry scream to high heaven before you give it to them. And then they learn to be whiny, right? So um, there's all sorts of government <clears throat> uh, pamphlets about this, and baby experts in Germany under the Nazis advocated such things things, cold heartedness towards babies really to break their spirits so you could have control of them later. So what I see we have now is a culture of competitive detachment where child raising is really uh, inappropriate and so it leads to poor psychosocial neurobiology, number two, and that you have adults, number three, that are really not very well and that moral capacities get limited because of their stress responses and dysregulation makes them self-protective. And then the culture uh, just keeps perpetuating this. The adults are distracted, overwhelmed, over controlling, or under controlling, and then they they kind of keep it going. And we we're going in the wrong direction, in my view. So what happens is you got stress reactivity, and you either attack or withdraw. Uh, that's the mode. Um, one up, one down. Um, safe or unsafe. You feel unsafe most of the time, and so you're going to be quite vicious. Uh, if you use your higher order capacities, your abstract thinking, your planfulness in ways that's combative and attacking <clears throat> on the left side there, or you'll be detached like us professors tend to we have been from uh, families where we learned avoidant attachment, that emotions were not safe to express, uh, don't develop your social emotional intelligence very well. And you develop your cognitive intelligence better. And so you learn to be detached. You learn to live in that ivory tower way of being um, in, uh, in the society. I'm going to keep going here. <clears throat> so we have a society built by undercare, I think. So that big um, bubble there is the self-protection ethic, I call it, uh, where you go into either withdrawal or domination of others. You know, I'm gonna, I feel be I'm better than them in whatever it is. Or I'm just not going. I'm going to just withdraw and disappear. <clears throat> and then your imagination, your ability to plan, is all about dominance or submission or to a authority, authoritarian, for example. And you really don't have much sense of who you are. You've lost yourself. You've lost your heart. You've lost your unique path. <clears throat> so what are what are um, professional ethical responsibilities then here. We need to educate parents and our community members about the evolved nest and advocate for humane treatment of babies and young children, decreasing stress to pregnant moms, 
decreasing perinatal trauma, facilitating breastfeeding, encouraging positive touch, skin to skin, of course, supporting free play, self-directed play, and community support in all sorts of ways. You can see our society has been going in the wrong direction for a while, USA anyway. <clears throat> And this is what we need to do then to return to our heritage is to provide that camp companionship caregiving, number one there, in early life and promote um, good physio neurosocial biology that leads to adults with well-being and wisdom. And they build a community that tends to basic needs. So this is our heritage and I think we can intervene at each point. We can um, provide um, for basic needs, um, providing the evolved nest throughout childhood, actually through adulthood too. I need mentors. I need social support. We all do. And we need to then support balance and healing in the adults that were under cared for, who are um, off kilter, who are embedded in a sense of disconnection. And then we need to build the narratives, the stories, and institutions that emphasize the connections that we have. And in our recent work, we've actually also included nature connection. So part of our heritage is to be very much connected to the well-being of our nature community, our landscape, the animals, plants, trees, rivers, mountains around us are part of our community. And this is the indigenous worldview uh, that I'm starting to emphasize more. So we want to formulate policies on best care, early care, and make sure the institutions and structures support child well-being, pay attention to how the early nest affects outcomes, and conduct longitudinal studies on the relation of experience, early experience to long-term mental and physical health. And I, um, so well, we want to support parents in providing the early nest and being emotionally present. So when I see a baby in, a, in the grocery store that, um, who's crying and the parents are down the aisle doing something and I'll go talk to the baby and, and say, oh, it's okay, you'll be fine. Uh, your parents are, they love you very much. And one time this um, family came by and said, oh, I thought it was okay to let babies cry. So I said, <clears throat> I educated them a little bit. <laughs> uh, so we want to provide all children with supportive, local, positive social support, lots of free play, Immersion in the natural world, nature connection is really important. It's a good way to heal as well. Treating babies as equal human beings, we can all do this. We can respect the evolved nest, find ways to respect babies first. <clears throat> I think they're prior, uh, should be a priority, so I'm being a baby advocate here. And in workplaces, we need to decentralize work, allowing work at home, which is happening in some places, but usually only for the well-off people. And then uh, high quality daycares in workplaces, supporting babies to work so moms can take them with them to be breastfeed and be there, carrying them on their bodies, support keeping extended families together, but make sure those extended families know what babies need. And so then uh, we will promote what our ancestral life promoted, uh, which is a high engagement ethic, enjoying each other most of the time, using our imaginations for positive uh, social connection. Okay, I'm almost done. <laughs> Early toxic stress then undermines health and well-being, and morality, uh, which I didn't say too much about, but uh, we have a lot of studies now published on that. <clears throat> and poor child rearing pushes us to lower levels of well-being as a society. And we, but we, then we start to think that's normal, but it's not normal. And we can intervene again at multiple levels. So I think APA's 12 guiding principles are covered throughout this, what I've just presented. I mean, it's, they're just marvelous, a nice uh, set of ways of thinking about what babies need and what the evolved nest then is to give more concrete pieces of how to treat a baby. And I think uh, we can do more integrating ahead. So thanks very much. Thank you so much, Darsha. That was wonderful. And I just want to let everyone know that the 12 guiding principles that were referenced here um, are APA's foundational principles that we are very happy to support. And uh, there will be brochures available at the Congress. And there are ways to get brochures of those 12 guiding principles that then you can also go and distribute in the areas of work 
that you are in. So I just want to share that as we go into questions. Uh, if anyone has any questions for Darsha, we have 10 minutes here to go deeper together. I, I have a, what a great presentation, thank you. And I would love the PDF. Yes, that's, that will come. Uh, and that'll be in the classroom for you in a few days time. So you either can raise your hand or open your mic and please go ahead and ask your questions. There's a lot of thank you, Darsha. <laughs> Barbara Decker. I'll be teaching a newborn class um, this next Wednesday night. <clears throat> and one of the challenges that I find is when I present uh, Darsha's work, um, the parents that are going back to work are really, they're really um, ambivalent about how they're going to be able to get their sleep and, and still be able to um, take care of the baby's needs. Uh, we have such a short time that our families are able to stay home with our children. And, <clears throat> and so I, I try to promote this, this information that the, the sleep training is a challenge um, because they really need their sleep. So how can we help them balance going back to work and, um, and still being there for their children? Thank you. Yes, this is really a, a quite a conundrum in our society because we don't support parents hardly at all, I think, anymore. And I, what I have said to people who ask me directly is that this investment in, early, in the early life of your children is a long-term uh, payoff. Uh, and so if you can decrease your needs for this time period, in some fashion and have uh, coordinate being able to stay home uh, at least part of the time or having a um, well-trained or informed uh, caregiver, the consistent caregiver who's going to be there when you can't be there. That's what needs to be done. But um, I think part of it is we think we're supposed to have such a high standard of living. And so you want to go and have the big house and the big you know, job, but that's not what's going to make a happy family, right? In the end, if you can let go of some of those needs, not getting the latest iPhone, not getting the latest car, whatever it is, and put yourself in with that child is what I, I emphasize. Um, our ancestors didn't need very much. They knew that in, in some way that that um, is distracting from having a happy life. And that's what we know from research now is that having material goods does not make you happy. You need a certain amount of income to be able to, you know, eat <laughs> and have shelter and all that. But after that, it's really relationships that matter. So some of this is uh, parents kind of have to be healed or heal themselves or have help healing. So they trust relationships. I think a lot of us have learned not to. <clears throat> and so work is so much more fun <laughs> because it's hard if you don't know how to get along with others. It's so stressful, right? It's much easier just to go to work and a lot of adults, unfortunately, think that's more fun. So we have that also in the mix. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Pamela, please. And then we have a few other questions in the chat here. Go ahead and unmute yourself, Pamela. It's... Okay, that's better. Um, you were saying that children infants shouldn't sleep alone. But does that necessarily mean sleeping in the same bed with the parents or having a crib beside the bed? Well, our, our ancestral uh, conditions and all over the world, people sleep in the same bed. Yeah, uh, It's just that when you feed babies formula, they tend to sleep too deeply in, or if parents are obese or drinking or smoking, they tend to be less sensitive. Uh, if they're not breastfeeding. So we have then put these measures in place or advice to um, keep from, well, I mean, there's SIDS. Is, you should read uh, James McKenna, yes. his, uh, his uh, website, co-sleeping.nd.gov. 
Edu. He uh, talks about the how the coroners assume that when a baby dies in a parent's bed, they've been rolled on, but that's not true necessarily. There's babies die for all sorts of reasons. So there's all sorts of misinformation about SIDS. It's actually formula use seems to be the big thing, uh, and sleeping next to the baby actually keeps some babies alive because they forget to breathe because they need you to learn how to breathe and all sorts of systems. You need the parent right there. So there are safe uh, systems, uh, having a little uh, bed, uh, extra bed carrier on the side of the bed is probably the safe one to use these days. Having a crib in the same room as co-sleeping, that's not bed sharing, but it's co-sleeping, that would be better than down the hall, but um, babies expect to be with you. And so if you put them in the crib next to you, they're going to, you know, hey, I want to be next to you, right? So they're going to make more protest about that. Uh, they will down the hall, but you won't hear it. <laughs> so it's complicated now. We made it so hard. And the parents have to get up and go to work, you know. It didn't used to be that we slept eight hours in a row. People would sleep four hours, get up and walk around, da -da -da -da, go back, sleep some more, or they sleep through the day. That's our heritage, too. And so we're fighting all sorts of species, normal ways of being. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Pamela. Sandra, you had, you had a question. You, can you unmute or would you like me to ask it? I can. Hey, Sai. So thank you, Nina. How are you guys, everyone? Good. Good. Uh, great presentation. Thank you so much, Darcia. And I was inspired by a moment when you were talking regarding to the, um, you know, how we can support the mother, uh, you know, little baby, you know, newborn, and um, sharing, you know, the tasks, you know, at the you know, the shores in, and at the house, washing clothes and things like this. But, but that's what a doula we are looking, we are training. I, you know, I'm Sandra Hernandez and we, we, we created this doula training in Oregon, but specifically for Latinas, doulas Latinas. Uh, and uh, I was just thinking if you can talk a little bit more regarding with the emotional health of the doula care, uh, uh, you know, for the baby and also, of course, the mother in postpartum care, uh, you know, in this whole process that we are discussing regarding, you know, well, the respect of the, to the, towards the baby, um, how this is so important in their emotional development. Yeah, yeah, very good. So doula education, yeah, that's part of our, what we need. And we need doulas everywhere, right? Yeah, I think so too. I'm, I'm, I'm. I started believing that we created this program six years ago. Uh, this exactly because in Oregon we didn't have doulas Latinas. Oh. Um, we have a we have already had already a great program for the African Americans, you know, black communities. Besides, you no, know, the you know, all Caucasians, everyone, and some Native Americans, but Latinas. Not at all. Oh. So, and because, well, I'm a psychologist, so for my background, that's what I started there, why also I joined APA a few years ago uh, and want to learn it more and how we can apply those and preparing doulas to do this. Yeah, good. Should work on it together. <laughs> oh, thank you, Darcia. That would be wonderful. I'd like to hear more from you later. It's right. wonderful. It's really nice to have you here, Sandra. Florentine wrote something in the chat, and then we'll get to the other hands that are up. If, if Darsha, you still have some time beyond Certainly. the hour. Florentine, please. Yeah, hi. Yeah, I found it very interesting about the difference between girls and boys. I mean, there is this saying that, that boys are a little slower, you know, but I actually didn't know that already from, you know, very young age onwards, there's actually a brain difference. Mm -hmm. I was like, wow, can you a little bit more about that also maybe give some references about that if you have some for further reading about that. Alan, Alan Shore has written about this he has a very uh, um, detailed article about the differences uh, between boys and girls in early life so he's the one to look at um, do you write that into the oh it's there did someone write it Alan Shore, yeah, and I wrote a blog about it, which has a link. 
and I forget what the blog name is, all our sons. Oh, be worried, my, my blog is be worried about boys, especially baby boys. If you Google that, you will find the links to him. Uh, but yeah, there's all sorts of different systems, and I don't know the details off the top of my head, uh, that are just kind of not developed as, for, as well. One of them is the corpus callosum, the, the uh, part of the brain that unites the two halves, is, is just less developed in boys. Girls have that already kind of built in uh, a great deal about it. Uh, of it and so when a boy is neglected this connector doesn't develop well and so they can flip into states more easily go from rage to panic or whatever uh, and they can't control they have many less built-in self-regulatory systems so great great question um, Thank let's you. see Maharani, you had your hand up, and then Lucia will get to you. I thank you, Dasha, for your talk. I am really, these are the same things that I am um, addressing or trying to address. And the key thing that you brought up is to work with the medical community. And it's just, that seems to be the greatest barrier, though, because the the entrenchment of standard practice and I have no idea. I mean, I used to teach at a medical school and it was kind of really heartbreaking at the end. I was in the preclinical because all the students, the medical students and the nursing students would come back and talk to me. And it's just like, well, why is this this way? And there was just, I don't know. Do you have any insight on how to get this information to the people that are either educating the students or actually in the medical field? Because I'm struggling. I struggle. Yeah, that's a great question. I'm not sure I have any particular insights. Uh, Laura Duckett, though, who's a nurse uh, emerita from the University of Minnesota, she and I are co-editing a journal, a special issue for the Journal of Human Lactation, and we're writing a pay, uh, essay right now on ethics for that journal. So I will ask her, <laughs> but uh, that might be something that we all have to put our heads together. I mean, the insurance companies control the medical practices in many ways now and doctors are so stressed they can't do what they used to do when we when I was little I uh, have much time with uh, patients and uh, so we're just really in this uh, between a rock and hard place in many ways in terms of what's needed and what's being done it's going in the wrong direction still but maybe yeah, uh, I mean, yeah. go ahead it was just for me as I now work as a doula or one of the things that I do is as a birth doula and I just saw how stressed and uh, traumatized actually the clinicians are. It was quite astonishing. And so I've been trying to approach them to see if I can just offer, you know, yoga or meditation because that's my other thing or yoga nidra or something. And um, even, you know, just, I can't even get in the door or I can't, you know, like they're all like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or I'm also an end of life doula. And with some of the births that I've supported, um, I saw that the staff were not prepared at all for the, the death of the baby, the passing of the baby. And I just said, you know, do you want to talk about it? I can, can I'm available, please contact me because this is a trauma if you're not prepared for it. And I know that actually clinically, they do not prepare um, doctors and nurses with death. And you know, it's sort of like, it's frustrating because at each time there's a sort of block that keeps coming up and popping up. But I suppose that's great. I, I mean, I see that um, I'm inspired that you're working with a nurse and maybe that's the way is to involve some a staff member into research and into this and that's such of the way in and they can bring that back to their uh, workplace or their community or whatever and so that's a great um, 
approach, I think. Thank you. The, the other one is uh, the Baby Friendly Hospital Initiative. Baby Friendly Hospitals, so that's having some impact. I have nurse friends who are lactation consultants who, but they say, you know, the old doctors, you know, want to do it their old way and they don't want to follow it. So I think it takes a generation of shift. Uh, so hopefully the younger people will bring about some of these changes. I'm in the Middle East, so we have baby friendly hospitals wow. and that doesn't mean anything oh. because <laughs> everybody just puts up the posters every place else and then, you know, we do it always. But yeah, no, I mean, I see that there is a change and I guess part of it is also, you know, it's wonderful what APA is doing and because there is then these um, support, I mean, this, the education is getting out there. And so um, for me, it's using this information and just having it accessible um, with the breastfeeding cafes that I run and just in general, like whoever I deal with. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so that, you know, I see, like, I guess at a grassroots level, that's changing. We're changing the, the mindset and um, with having information available. Uh, I just don't know how to reach the doctors, yeah. I guess, yeah. is where I'm finding the, the block. Yeah, so hopefully we can bubble up uh, that there'll be such widespread assumptions or that are taken up that the doctors will have to respond, we hope. Mm. Thank you. And it's very beautiful um, what you're bringing up. I had a group mentoring call just before this. And we talked about the same thing. How do we really make change on a global mass, mass level? And uh, we, we spoke about that it's really about the roles that we're in. Each of us are playing our roles and we're planting little seeds. Mm -hmm. yep. And from that little seed, a beautiful mango tree will grow with fruits, right? And so just helping the people who are coming in front of us, sharing what we know in, in just these little ways can make a big difference. And then another piece that was uh, that came out is that it's really about coming together like we are today and saying, yes, this work needs to be done. And yes, we're not alone in this. And look, we're all over the world right now. And we all have the same passion to change how we are bringing in our, our children and bringing them into life and developing them in beautiful ways. So um, just to share a little bit uh, on, on what you shared. And uh, Lucia, uh, please go ahead with your question. And oh, hi, hi, Darsha. Thank you so much for your talk. It was it was really inspiring. Uh, so my question is: uh, as postpartum doulas, we uh, not always have the time to prepare the parents before we go and do the work, right? So. Um, how do we navigate between advocating for babies and not being judgmental of the parents' decisions of, you know, for example, I don't want to breastfeed. I rather feed, you know, with formula or even our, my breast milk, but I don't want to breastfeed or, you know, a, a lot of other decisions they make. But that's something that I always think about, like how we navigate in between those two things. Yeah, it's a challenge. Yeah. I, I think uh, emphasizing the positive things. Uh, so maybe they don't want to breastfeed, then you can say, oh, and think about when you give them the bottle and putting them skin to skin and looking in their eye, that's actually developing the brain, you know, and the right brain is growing really rapidly now. And they're going to be really uh, socially smart. If you do it that way, you know, they'll learn to be socially smart and, and compliment them on their responsiveness. Uh, oh, look how he smiled at you when you did this or something, you know, and how much, he, oh, look at how he's enjoying you touching him or whatever it is to emphasize, kind of have the nest in mind and then emphasize what they're doing to meet that nest needs. Right. That's, that's really good. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. Beautiful. Um, Mark, did you want to share what you wrote here? Because I think it's significant as we're heading into this. Um. Mm -hmm. um, 
I find it easy to write it because I get so emotional about this. <laughs> when I start to talk, I get kind of choked up. Um, uh, I, I was sitting today having lunch in, a, in a, a very small cafe in my hometown, taking a break from my work. And there was a young couple on the table next to me and uh, their food arrived. And they immediately took out the uh, phone and, and put a, a, a news program on, on the table in the small cafe. It was like they couldn't sit and enjoy their food together without some kind of, you know, background distraction to um, to help them feel okay. <clears throat> and, and it just it gets me all the time, you know. It's uh, uh, yeah. Addiction to technology. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And they're little little babies, little children who are given iPhones to keep them quiet. And then when you take yeah. it away, I've had a restaurant experiences where they try to take mm-hmm. the, the phone away from the child, screams to high heaven. So then they have to give the phone back to keep the child quiet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I think one of the deeper points of what you shared in your writing, Mark, is is that the technology really takes us away from our own wisdom, from our own knowing of what mm-hmm. we need in that moment in time mm-hmm. yeah so we reach for the technology but really mm-hmm. what we need is a hug <laughs> absolutely yeah 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 and then it seems that uh, that becomes that becomes easier and then we get more used to it and we get further away from each other um you know it's yeah it's it's <laughs> I, I've got so much energy around this that I, I, I need to do something with it, but I, um, but I don't quite know how to do it constructively <laughs> without getting upset. <laughs> Barbara Decker just wrote a, a beautiful idea for you. Um, I didn't see that. Actually, yeah. She said, um, Barbara, do you want to share your, your yeah. piece? Because I think it's, it's important for all of us. Uh, what I try to do, especially um, in my classes, is I give them a resource sheet and um, I let them know that um, the, the information is not just coming from me as a childbirth educator and I've had the exposure through APA, that it opens a door for them to read um, the research because in Seattle, everybody goes by the research. If there isn't research, they're not going to listen to it. And um, so rather than my speaking, I let the research speak for themselves. I send them to McKenna as a resource. I send them to APA as a resource. I say, I give out um, Darsha's articles um, during the newborn class. And um, they, I also encourage baby wearing. Uh, in my newborn class. I have them bring their slings or whatever they've got for carrying the babies. And um, it's great fun to help them uh, learn how to tie on a Moby wrap. Um, and <laughs> this actually um, encourages the, the fathers, the partners to take part in this baby wearing because that's one way that we have learned from um, underdeveloped countries that their baby's emotional regulation is oftentimes better because they're, they're being carried all the time on the body and they don't cry as much. So when they hear, hear that they don't cry as much, that's something that's going to make them look into the information. So just a thought. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, We're almost 15 minutes over the hour, and I just want to respect everyone's time. This has been just a very dynamic and interactive um, exchange with all of us. And I thank you, Darsha, so much for coming today and sharing your wisdom with all of us. I think we are all just delighted um, to know that there are articles that you've put together, the books that you have written, are providing us also evidence-based resources to give to parents and to people that we're working with. So thank you for continuing to do this wonderful work. And I just wanna say thank you all for joining today. And next week uh, we will have Kyla Taylor, who is a licensed marriage and family therapist, who will be giving an introduction to inner ethics So how and why we talk to ourselves and others about our motivations. 
And I think it's really important we speak a lot about languaging and where we're coming from, what our biases are, and then holding the space for sharing this work and educating others. And um, I, we look forward to having her next week. So thank you again, Darsha. Many blessings to you all. Have a beautiful week.